So I'm going to do my best to keep him afoot as he comes to stage to tell you how the next generation of startups are not building apps. Paul Adams, everybody. Hey, everybody. I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, and more interestingly, probably, I'm going to talk about the intersection of these things. So the first thing is the internet. Uh, this is a picture of the internet that I found on the internet. Uh, so it's probably not actually a picture of the internet. Um, the thing that I, I want to remind everybody about the internet is that it's really young. It's only about 20 years old uh, for all practical purposes. And in the history of media technologies, communication technologies, that's actually not a long time at all. And the best way to understand these things is to look back at other times in history when other transformational technologies emerged. And if you do that, you see that these take decades to stabilize. And in the short time the internet's been with us, it's actually transformed most of society. Most of society in ways that we could never have imagined. Uh, it's totally changed news, for example. Totally changed where we go to news, how news breaks. It's changed how we buy things. Uh, whether that's online with Amazon, places like that, it's changed the economics of that, but also offline. Now these offline businesses also have to adapt and it changes the economics of their business. It's changed how we communicate. This is my gratuitous family photograph. Uh, this is obviously me uh, and my wife and our twins who were born here in San Francisco when we lived here. And uh, for my parents, this was their first grandchildren and they uh, got to experience the, not the actual birth, you'll be glad to hear, that would be extremely weird, but uh, soon after that, uh, we cleaned up, uh, they got to FaceTime, uh, chat with us, and actually see their first grandchildren move, and, and so on, and, and, and see how wrecked we looked, and all sorts of things. But it was very real, it was very real. And even if you went back five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, the experience for them would have been entirely different. They would have had to wait for us to take photographs, print them, uh, or uh, post them to them. Maybe later there was like video, you could shoot on a camcorder and email it. But the, the technologies have changed and the, and, and, and the internet in such a short space of time has really changed how we communicate with each other. Um, it's also changed how we navigate the world. So again, I'm aging myself to say that I remember a time when I used to read books and like get maps before I went on an airplane to go somewhere else. Uh, no one does that anymore, really. Uh, maybe uh, some older people like me do. Most people don't. They just get on the plane. Uh, the plane lands. They get off. They take out their phone, and it kind of tells them where to go. It kind of tells them where they are, what's around, what's next, what's recommended, and so on. So it's actually changed how people move about, uh, move about space, move about physical space. <laughs> I'll just keep going. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so the internet's young, it's really young, uh, and it's changing. Uh, it's changing all the time, you know. Uh, we didn't have Pokemon Go in our lives uh, for, until very recently. Uh, who knows what's next? So it's important to remember that it is changing. It's changing things and changing things fast. So the second thing is interfaces. And what I mean by an interface uh, is actually quite simple. Uh, for me, it's a thing that connects the makers of something with the consumers of that thing. It's really that simple. It's the thing that connects. So you can draw it, and you could draw it like this, that there is an interface in the middle connecting a business. That could be any type of business making anything. Everyone in here tonight you know, probably works for a business. If you're building an app, working in a startup, in a technology company, you're making something, and you have consumers. You want people to use that thing. And so this isn't new. Interfaces aren't a new thing. We didn't like, make them up in the, in the digital era. You know, you can go back hundreds of years, you can go back to like markets and market stalls, and a market stall was the interface, the thing that connects a business person with potential customers. And stores are exactly the same. So the store is this interface between the business owner and potential customers. When the internet came about and the, and the first websites uh, were being launched and developed, it looked very similar. I don't know if, who remembers the Boo Party. Uh, pretty cool times. Uh, and this was also the interface. This was the thing that connected, apparently, people who used the internet back then uh, with, uh, apparently, startups back then. So it was a thing that connected them. The interface was a thing. The, the website was an interface. What's interesting about this, what's interesting with all these interfaces, is that they're actually all destinations. They're all destinations. 
uh, we, we say things like we need to drive traffic to a destination. The market still was the destination, store was, and websites are, and apps are. These are all things that we make, and they're all destinations. We want people to go to our website, and we, we measure that by traffic, by, by, by people that actually have to navigate to it. Mobile apps are exactly the same. So interfaces simply connect businesses and consumers, and up until now, interfaces have always been destinations. So our third thing is people. Uh, this is an amazing photograph. Uh, it's obviously Earth uh, from space. It's obviously taken by NASA or someone similar. And uh, when you look at this, uh, I think it's actually pretty amazing because you can see where people are. It's an amazing thing. You can see Madrid in the center. This is Iberia, you know, Spain and Portugal, the northern tip of Africa. You can see Madrid, you can see Valencia, you can see Portugal, uh, Lisbon, and so on. Uh, it's an amazing photograph. You can look at that from space and say, that's where most people are. And what's amazing about this photograph is it tells you that we're connected. We're actually all connected to one another. And the, the, the a sense of connection is actually one of the most primal motivators of the human species. We want to connect with one another. We feel like we need to connect with one another. And the second universal truth about us is that we're social. We live for our family and friends, colleagues too, I should add, family, friends, and colleagues, in that order probably. And, uh, <laughs> But our lives revolve around that. That's what our lives revolve around. Like, think about everything in your life, the things you do every day. Um, they all revolve around other people. They all revolve around other people. And when you put these things together, what you start to see is that you have this transformational technology, this internet. You have the, the, the notion that people orient around other people. And so it becomes obvious in hindsight, I guess, that these things would merge, that they would connect themselves, that the internet would actually re-architect itself around people, and all the services and things we'd build on the internet would be centered around people and connections and relationships. And when I, work, I happened to work at Google and Facebook in the time that this was emerging as a huge paradigm shift, and what was amazing about that, looking back, is both those companies, I think, for the most part, thought this was a zero-sum game. There would be one winner, and one winner only. And at the time, obviously, Facebook was winning, and Google felt this existential threat that they needed to, to win and own the address book or own the social graph. And if you owned that, you would have this immense power. Uh, but that's not actually what happened at all. It was not a zero-sum game. What actually happened was that there were many winners. There was uh, you know, over a dozen apps, for example, right now, with over 100 million active users. Many people won. There, th this change was so profound, this orientation, reorientation around people was so profound that there were many, many, many companies that were successful. And if you extend this, extend this idea, not to just messengers and social platforms and say anything that connects people, any product or service that connects people, like Uber and Postmates and Airbnb, they're connecting people to do new things in new ways. If you actually extend that idea, pretty much every fast-growing company, every fast-growing technology company is oriented around this idea of people and connecting people, uh, offering new value in new ways. And that's just because the internet's catching up at real life. That's all that's happening. It's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, what's interesting, though, is we're past the point of no return. Like this, is, this shift has happened. And so I think it's fair to say that the internet is now deeply oriented around people. That change is not going to reverse. So when you kind of get the sense of this, that, that the internet is oriented around people, then you start to uh, explore the connection and relationship between the internet, this, fun, this foundational technology, these interfaces that up until now have been these destinations, and this orientation around people. And you know, as you've already seen, like, these are destinations. These websites that we made are destinations. But not only that, they're also um, heavily inspired and influenced by the, their predecessing technologies. So this website, the BBC, just looks like a newspaper. It just does. And it's because they're heavily influenced by the technologies that came before. And this is, this is changing. You know, we're, we're, we're moving away from thinking about pages and traffic and destinations. And we're moving on to something quite different. We can all feel this. I think it's quite intuitive. When you think of things like the App Store, you realize that that's simply a destination to download other destinations. And it's broken. Like, everyone can sense that this model is broken. There's something wrong with it. If you build a mobile app and you want users and need users, new users, you basically buy ads. That's what you do. 
because people aren't browsing the app store. People aren't sitting at home thinking, I wish I had a new app. <laughs> Some startups think that happens. Uh, so there's something broken, something fundamentally broken. And what's actually happening, in my opinion, is that, of course, people aren't browsing the App Store. They used to. They're not now. But they are on these social platforms. Hundreds of millions of people are on over a dozen, heading towards dozens, if you count the Airbnbs and Ubers and Postmates of the world, probably hundreds uh, of these new types of services and these new huge platforms. So this is changing. The interfaces of the Internet are changing. And so what you get, basically, when you look at all of these things in combination, that the Internet's young and changing, that these interfaces being destinations is changing, and it's been oriented around people, I think you get basically two tracks of thought. There's probably more. These are the two I, I wanted to highlight today. The first is that we're moving towards people-oriented systems, not destinations. So. If you look at the App Store and look at why it was successful, there's a bunch of things in that. Discovery was one, like you could get discovered in the early days, you can't really anymore. Payments was a big thing, no one wants to deal in payments, it's a total cluster, you just don't want to do it, you just outsource it to some other company uh, who does it way better. Apple had uh, iTunes and a whole payment infrastructure there. Nowadays, all the social platforms like Facebook have also got payment infrastructure, and you've got companies like Stripe and so on who are doing really interesting things to take all of that away. So that's been eroded, that, that competitive advantage of these destinations was being, has been eroded. And the hardware thing's been eroded as well. A lot of the most modern browsers and mobile browsers can do some of the things that you would rely on the hardware to do in the past. So this is, this is eroding. And meanwhile, something fascinating is happening with these social platforms, where uh, this is Bitmoji, by the way. That's not me. Uh, it would be like the worst Bitmoji of me. I don't look like that. Uh, I don't know if you guys use Bitmoji, but I discovered it because somebody else used it, and I was chatting with them on Facebook, and they sent me a Bitmoji of them, and I was like, that's cool, well, I want that. Uh, it was ridiculous. Uh, and so I made a Bitmoji of myself, and then I started using it with other people, and they were like, I want that, what is that? And you can see that uh, this is now discovery in context. You're actually discovering this thing, and it's there, like on the thing, if, you know, if you're like, dumb enough to not actually ask your friend you're talking to, what is that? It's actually written there, Bitmoji. All right, got it. Uh, so, you're dis so you're discovering it uh, in, the, in the context of the conversation. It's way more valuable. And you know, Bitmoji as a, as a company don't need, uh, don't need a, an app store distribution thing. These social platforms are so big that Bitmoji can easily organically grow in context on the back of those numbers. So when you think about these things, that that, that there's a destination, an interface that's a destination sitting between a customer and a business, um, you, you, start to see, you start to look and you start to see other types of things, like Bitmoji. I love this example. This is Uber inside Facebook Messenger. And again, this is discovery in context. You, know, you can call an Uber, get an Uber. It's happening in the, in the flow of a conversation. What's fascinating about this is that this is not a destination for Uber. Uber aren't thinking about Messenger as a destination. They're not, like, there's no ads driving traffic paid by Uber to Facebook Messenger. Right? That's just not happening. So it's not a destination. No one's thinking about it as a destination. No one's thinking about pages or traffic or any of that, any of that stuff. Something else is happening. And what, and what they have to do is they have to actually start to think about how to design a system around that. Suddenly, it's a people-oriented system. It's like, oh shit, if we're, if we're designing Uber inside Facebook and other social platforms, there's a whole new set of constraints, a whole new set of criteria that we need to figure out. And so you end up with like, just lots of different things. It's just different. It's just, it's just different. So that's the first thing, people-oriented systems. The second thing is that there are many types of interfaces, multiple interfaces, not just apps. I'll just run through some really fast to give you a sense of this. Uh, voice is the first. Voice is cool, really cool. No one really knows what's going on with voice at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is this thing the next big thing or a brick? I don't, who knows? Uh, and it's easy to get attracted to that. A voice is cool, and it's easy to get attracted to that. But there's way more interesting things happening, I think. Or not more interesting, different. Things that are overlooked. Like Magic is one of, you know, one of Silicon Valley's most interesting startups are doing some interesting stuff. The technology Magic uses is SMS. Not cool voice AI, machine learning, etc. cetera. Uh, it's SMS. It, that's their interface. Their interface is just texting. And that's interesting, right? The interface they chose they didn't build an app, they didn't build a fancy thing. They just said SMS, easy to understand, global distribution, everyone's got it, blah, 
like, why would you not use SMS? And Lei, which is the uh, Chinese version of Magic, uses WeChat, exactly the same thing. Why would we build this new interface, this proprietary UI, put it in an app store when we can just build on WeChat? That's where all the people are. And there's lots of other examples. X.ai is another, again, one of the other most interesting startups happening around. And their interface, the interface that they chose, was email. It's just email. And, and this is so profound for them that they say, no sign up, no password, no download. You just email, right? The whole service is, is through the interface of email. Again, easy to understand. Everyone's got it. So when you think about these things, there's also other platforms you can build on. You could build a Slack app. You could build a bot in Facebook Messenger. Uh, you could build a card for um, Twitter. Like Twitter has a whole card platform. You know, your, your whole interface can just be cards sitting inside Twitter. There's a whole, whole heap of options. You could just have APIs. And, and there's lots of new companies at the end of the day. The I stands for interface. And there's lots of opportunities to build things that are just APIs talking to other APIs, things that are connecting to new things and providing value for people. And you know, this, again, isn't that new? Charles Eames, uh, who was a famous designer in the 1950s, uh, had this quote where, where he said, eventually everything connects. And I think that's profoundly happening now because of the internet mostly. We're being connected together in all these new, interesting ways. So when you think about these things, uh, you, can, you, you realize there are many types of interfaces. And these many types of internet interfaces uh, are connecting people who make things to people who might want to consume them. So the internet is young, it's changing, uh, it's oriented around people now, it's all about systems and system design. There are many different types of interfaces. And I'm going to leave you with a stark, uh, stark reminder of why this matters. Uh, this is an amazing thing. The Fortune 500 was actually created fairly recently in 1955. And of the first 500 companies, here's like the 500 best companies at the time that Fortune chose. Out of those 500, only 67 still exist. That's not a long time ago. It's like 50 or 60 years ago. And the reason they don't exist is because they didn't adapt to change. They, they didn't see change as was happening around them. And by definition, our industry is changing and changing fast. And so everything you do today, all the things you th think you know today, won't be there tomorrow. There'll be different things tomorrow. I hope you embrace that idea. That's it. Thank you.